Okay, then um, thank you for the uh, kind introduction and also I'm very happy about the invitation to give some lectures here. So I will give uh, three lectures here um, today, I think on Thursday and Friday. And in these lectures, I want to introduce some tools and some frameworks which are, I think, useful in cases where we have systems which are not integrable or we have systems where we not yet have understood how to solve them exactly. And with these tools, we will then be able to, on the, the one hand, to analyze quantum states or to uh, derive ideas that can we can use to classify different states of matter, and also that we can uh, use it to simulate systems efficiently uh, on a computer. So basically, I go away how we can efficiently simulate quantum many-body systems on a computer and then study the ground state properties. So in the first lecture, so this is a lecture today, I want to discuss uh, or introduce some concepts of entanglement, so the sort of a many-body entanglement of different parts of a system, and want to introduce the concept of matrix product states. So matrix product states are a way to efficiently represent ground states of local Hamiltonians in one dimension, mainly. Uh, so, and after having introduced these tools, I will actually use these um, matrix product states to derive a classification of so-called symmetry-protected topological phases. So these symmetry-protected topological phases are phases of matter that cannot be classified by symmetry breaking, but yet they are only defined as long as certain symmetries are preserved. And here we can actually, using these matrix product states, derive a, uh, a complete classification of these states. Uh, and in the last part, in the last lecture, I actually want to introduce uh, some numerical tools that are based on the matrix product state uh, representation of states and show how we can simulate systems and find the ground state uh, in this matrix product state representation and then this actually allows us to extract all kinds of uh, fingerprints of uh, topological phases, but we can also analyze uh, regular kind of symmetry breaking phases. So this is roughly the outline of these three lectures. Let me now start um, with, the, um, with the first lecture here. So let's now talk about entanglement and matrix product states. So let me just first for this introduce the uh, concept of uh, entanglement. And for basically everything that I'm discussing in these three lectures, I will focus on uh, one-dimensional systems. So we'll look at one-dimensional quantum, quantum many-body systems. And the uh, systems we can think of having just some uh, alignment of, 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 of sites, and on each side, we have some, some local Hilbert space. As we saw in Paul Fenley's talk or um, lecture yesterday, um, like on each side, for example, we could have a um, spin that could be up or uh, down. Right. So, and what we want to do now is we want to form a um, uh, um, bipartition of the system. So we just um, say that we have one part of the system is A and one part of the system is B. So now just cut the system here, say, in the middle, and we just say that, well, all sides on the left are A and all sides on the right of this cut are B. And now we consider a uh, kind of it's a pure quantum state, like it's a simple quantum state, defined on the Hilbert space um, that describes the entire system. So um, for a generic system, if we say that we have a uh, d-dimensional local Hilbert space on a side, like d would be two in the case that uh, Paul Fenley discussed yesterday, then this, this Hilbert space has a total dimension of d to the power of l. Well, now let's assume that we have a system of l sides in total. And now, if I just doing this by partition, then I can just write this Hilbert space as a uh, tensor product of a Hilbert space that's defined only on A and a Hilbert space defined only on B. 
Now I want to introduce the um, concept of um, entanglement and basically we're just saying that we have a, a non-entangled or we have a product state if the um, if if all measurements in A are completely independent of measurements that we would do in B. And as a as a way to quantify the entanglement, basically we're saying like how much are the degrees of freedom in A and B entangled, we find it useful to look at the um, kind of von Neumann uh, kind of entanglement entropy. And the von Neumann entropy um, is like very generally for uh, the von Neumann entropy is is actually uh, the given. Let me see. So what we're doing is we're just calculating the reduced density matrix for a state. So so the reduced density matrix, say for A, we get by tracing out subsystem B from the full density matrix of the state. And since the, the state that we are looking is just, just a simple pure quantum state, we know that this, the density matrix for this state itself has zero entropy. Uh, but now we can look at the um, von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix, which we can call SA. It's equal to minus trace of rho A times log rho A, then this quantity actually tells us how mixed the reduced density matrix would be. Right? Just again, so we just first write down the full density matrix, which is the density matrix of a pure state, so it has zero entropy. Now we trace out a subsystem, so we trace out what the degrees of freedom in B, and we are left with what we call the reduced density matrix. And now we calculate the entanglement, or we calculate the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix, and this gives us a measure of how mixed um, the reduced density matrix is, and this in turn tells us how much entanglement we have between the left part and the right part here. So. Basically, the definition of entanglement is like an entangled um, state uh, has like a non-zero or like a larger than zero uh, entanglement entropy, like SA. Okay, uh, so so now we can actually just sit down and um, calculate. Well, let's look at some simple examples and. The first example is we could just say that, well, let us just look at a simple uh, two-side system. So we just take two sides, and on each of these sides, we have a spin that can be uh, up or down. And now we can just write down a state. Let's just look at the first example, uh, which would be 1 divided by square root of 2 times up, down, or uh, let's just write it as a product state up, down, plus, down, <coughs> up. So everybody, everyone sees that this is an entangled state. And would someone know what the entanglement entropy would be for a bipartition of uh, the system um, into a left and a right spin? Right. So the entanglement is log 2. And just for fun, we could do the following. We could say that instead of having just um, two terms, the naive expression would be, well, let us just add more terms to the sum, then it might get more entangled. So we could say that, well, let us look at this state here. If you have up, up, plus, plus, down, up, plus, down, down. Anyone an idea what the entanglement entropy would be for this state? 
it's zero, right? Because actually, if you think again, we can just write down this state simply as up plus down times uh, up, like this is a tensor dot here, uh, plus down, which is basically just a product state in a sigma z basis. Uh, like this is just a sigma z in, in one direction. So here s a is zero. And in fact, this one is already the maximally entangled state because the total dimension, so, so, so the, the most entanglement we could have in the system is actually the logarithm of the dimension of the, the subspace. I mean, here, in this case, uh, this subspace, like say A and B, then the subspace uh, A actually has the um, dimension two, so the maximum entangled state has just an entanglement entropy of log two. Good. And then one can actually say a million things about entanglement entropies, but here I just want to leave it as this. So I just want to, all I want to say with these few lines is that we have quantum states which we can, for which we can form bipartitions, and then we can just look how much entanglement we have between these subsystems. And this entanglement is basically just telling us how, or the, 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 or the entanglement is basically just telling us how mixed the reduced density matrix is. And I want to introduce now a concept which is actually closely related to the entanglement which we will see in a minute, which is the um, Schmidt decomposition. So in a Schmidt decomposition, we again have a bipartition of our system, just using exactly the same picture again. And what we are doing now is the following. We take a quantum state psi, and we write it as a superposition of product states with some coefficients, alpha a, alpha b. So we have our quantum state and we just decompose it into a superposition of product states with respect to uh, this bipartition here. So um, the alpha a are forming an orthogonal basis of subsystem a and these alpha b form an orthogonal basis for subsystem b. So in particular we have uh, alpha, alpha prime is delta alpha, alpha prime. And also we can always choose the basis such that all Schmidt values are larger or equal zero. So and I'm gonna use this decomposition quite a bit uh, throughout the next lecture. So these ones here are the Schmidt values Schmidt values, and these are the Schmidt states. Good. And this uh, Schmidt decomposition of a given state is uh, actually unique up to uh, degeneracies in these Schmidt values. So, and one thing that you could derive in a, in a, in a homework <laughs> would be the following. If you have the, um, the Schmidt decomposition, you can actually see that it's very easy to calculate the, um, uh, uh, the entanglement. In particular, we find that the Schmidt values, or the, the Schmidt states, are actually the eigenstates of the reduced density matrix. So rho A 
and the eigen uh, the Schmidt values are the square roots of the eigen of the corresponding eigenvalues. Uh, you can just this is exercise number one, which you can show basically just by using this representation of the wave function and calculate the reduced density matrix, then you can actually see that the Schmidt values are the square roots of the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, and the Schmidt states are the eigenstates of the <coughs> reduced density matrix. Uh, the Schmidt values are the square roots of the eigenvalues, or the eigenvalues of the uh, yeah choose your favorite good no hmm? uh, thanks for asking so this sum here spans actually from one to the minimum of the two Hilbert spaces so if you have the um, the minimum of uh, uh, like the dimension of A and the dimension of B, and in order to have like a complete basis for these states, you would just have to add states to it. So you can just put. So you have a certain space that is spanned by those states that actually have non-zero Schmidt values, but then you can actually also extend these spaces to make a complete basis for uh, for the system. But in this sum, actually, there are only this sum only goes from one to the minimum of the two Hilbert spaces. If you, for example, would have like, again, like a, 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 a system with only one spin, then you only have D terms. Mm -hmm. Yes? Right, so then you can also find row B Yes. Exactly. This is a. Well, I haven't actually written this. This is what I'm going to write next. That having having uh, this relationship that we find here, we can actually use the Schmidt values to nicely calculate the entanglement entropy, which is then just minus the sum of uh, lambda, like sum over alpha lambda alpha squared times log of uh, lambda alpha squared. And then from this, as you pointed out, we can actually see that when we do a bipartition of our system, that the uh, entanglement entropy that we get from uh, row A and from row B would be the same. Yes? 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 Wait, yeah, so, so say that we're going to do exactly what you propose. So let's say that we have a, a system of, say, one, two, three, four, like six sites, and we have a Hilbert, like the local Hilbert space dimension would just be a, a two dimensional one, like, like for the Ising model. Now, if I just take an arbit like whatever quantum state I, I, I can I, I, I could come up with, then the maximum number of Schmidt states that I would need to do this decomposition would just be two. Right? So I just would write an I don't know, like let us just think of a fun state where we just have maybe singlets between those. So I just have like a dimerized state and I would only have uh, I mean then it's maybe too simple, but in this case clearly you see that there would be just the entanglement between those two sides. And if there would be also some entanglement between this one and this one, but it still can never be more than the log two. So the, the maximum number of states that we need to do this decomposition will be two. Yeah, alpha would go, so in, in this case, the sum would go from 1 to 2, because... Yeah, 
Well, let me just try to be a bit more. No, no, this is for the particular state. No, no, if you just make it even simpler, like if I just say that I have a product state, then I can just do this expansion just having a single state. If I say that I, my, my state is just whatever, maybe um, up times up times up and so on, then I would say, okay, I can write my state by just having a single, a single term. Right, so so then I can say that well, oops, my state psi is this one. So then, this state is just a single term in this Schmidt decomposition. If I, however, have a generic state, I can always find, in this case, always uh, two terms, like a sum of uh, like like this sum would only have two terms with different coefficients in front of it. This is what I'm saying, and. Uh, in order to have a complete basis for the larger part, we could then just say that, well, we have, in this case, we would find two orthogonal states from this decomposition, and then we have to find, in this case, I don't know, uh, two to the L minus two, uh, uh, two to the L of L A uh, B, say, um, states to, to complement this basis to a complete basis. Yes. So it would for the reduced density matrix. I mean, like if you change the state, the reduced density matrix changes and the uh, basis states will also change. I mean, this Good. So still let me just then maybe show some simple examples. So if we have a state that would be uh, a product state, as I just pointed out. If you have product states, then we basically find that lambda 1, like the maximum one, is 1, and all others, lambda, uh, lambda alpha larger than 1, are equal to 0. And the example was I just wrote down for if you just have like a product state of all spins up, then the alpha alpha equals to one state is just up, and the one for the right is also just all up. And the entanglement entropy is then zero. And the other extreme would be the maximally entangled state. And for this like if it does have a maximally entangled state, then the wave function is just alpha from one to n of uh, one divided square root by n. Uh, n is now the uh, um, dimension of the smaller of the two spaces times alpha, alpha. And the entropy would be log n. Like n is the Hilbert space dimension of the smaller of the two Hilbert spaces. And one fun thing to do is we could just say that we define a Hilbert space like on, on the system here and now we just do a bipartition of the system into two equal parts. 
A and B, and we just uh, draw random states from a Hilbert space. Someone, an idea, if a random state is closer to a product state or closer to a maximum entangled state. Yeah, and we, this is something I find quite interesting. Like, if we just choose a random state, so random, I mean that if I, I just write down a, I just define my Hilbert space, and now I define a wave function, like a, a, a random vector on this Hilbert space, and then I do a, perform a bipartition and calculate for this random vector the entanglement between the left part and the right part. Well, in fact, it doesn't matter. It, it like for, no, if I, if I um, like for the result that, that we get for this entanglement, like uh, basically we find, like let me just first state it. So then we find that the entanglement entropy for this one is then L half times log D minus one half. So if we just uh, choose the Hilbert space and we draw a random vector, like maybe for, from a uni uniform distribution or from just a binary di distribution of minus ones and plus ones, and we calculate the entanglement entropy for this state, we will find uh, it's approaching this value which is very close to a maximally entangled state. Oh, let me just use n here. Yes? Yes. Okay, thanks for asking. So, the um, entanglement of a state actually kind of encodes a lot of information that is in the state. So, so say that we have a, a quantum state and we want to analyze it, like in, in, in this context of uh, uh, kind of condensed matter, we might want to learn something about the order in the quantum state, or we want to learn about uh, critical properties of the state. And in both cases, we can use this entanglement entropy to actually learn about those properties of the state. So for example, the entanglement entropy of so-called topologically ordered states encodes information about the topological order in the state. And for critical points, like for 1D critical points, we can actually uh, kind of do kind of some, some, some scaling analysis of this entanglement entropy, and we can read off the central charge. So in this context, this is a very useful quantity to to extract kind of uh, information from from quantum states uh, from 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 from, from uh, kind of ground states of, of quantum anybody systems, <laughs> and in fact, the reason why I'm introducing this at the moment w will become clear now because what I want to make one. So so if we look at uh, ground states of local Hamiltonians, these will actually turn out to have very specific problems. In particular, gr we can well, there are some proofs that show that ground states, so while random states are very close to maximum entangled states, the ground states of local Hamiltonians will actually be very close to being product states. And which means that we can represent these um, states by only having only few terms in the Schmidt decomposition. And this is actually one thing that we can use to uh, motivate the so-called uh, matrix product states. Uh, yes? Uh-huh. 
Well, <laughs> this is in fact not easy, and I there are some attempts to do this in cold cold atoms. Like there there are some proposals of how one can not measure the uh, von Neumann entropy, but some so-called Rennie entropies, which are generalizations of this kind of entropy. And there there are some setups that we could use to to do this, but this is at the moment not working too well. No, here at the moment I think this is more like of a theoretical interest and not okay. very much to... Okay. So this is just more trying to understand the physics of kind of quantum many-body states and, and not so much about making proposals for experimentalists. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, depends what you would like to do. I mean, you could, for example, look just at a free fermion system, and there's still some non tr like some useful information in this, as what you call like the trivial entanglement in this wave function. So. I mean, you can subtract it, but you you don't have to. I mean, it depends what you what you are interested in. I mean, okay. Okay. Let me come now to the um, so-called area law. And this states the following. If I take uh, a ground state of a uh, gapped local Hamiltonians, um, then we would find that the, and now we do the following. We just take our, let me just, So let us say that we have some d-dimensional um, space, like here, for example, d would be two. And now we just cut out a block. So now we say this is a, this is b, of uh, dimension l cross l. Then the area law states that the entanglement entropy will grow as l to the power of uh, d minus one. So in this way, it's very different from a thermal entropy where we would expect that it, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is extensive. And in particular, this means in, in one dimensions, and this is the case we are mostly interested in, we would find that S is equal to a constant as long as uh, L is larger than the correlation length in the system. So C is the um, correlation length that we have in a, in a state. Good. And this is something which would make these states now very, very special. I mean, I, I pointed out that, the, that a random state fulfills a, a volume law, and only product states fulfill, like, so, so if we just draw a random state from the Hilbert space, we would find something that has a has a volume law, and in this, these states are extremely special. So, if we would draw the picture <laughs> of the the Hilbert space, then we would find that there's a very tiny corner of states that fulfill this area law, and this makes then ground states of local Hamiltonians um, super special. Uh, so here, and I think this is a very, very important point for everything I'm talking about throughout these lectures. All I'm saying is that we have a 
grounds that we are interested in the ground in ground states of uh, the gapped and local Hamiltonians. I mean, this is not too much to ask. I mean, this is still a huge class of different systems that we can can look at, and we already have from this uh, area law the promise we already know in which small corner in the Hilbert space we have to look. Yes? Uh, then you would still, so, so if, you, if you look at a, uh, say a one dimensional system, and you just cut out a box which you say is um, smaller than the correlation length, then first the entanglement would grow because the system wouldn't know it's a, it's a gapped. So, so basically then you would see that it will grow and then it will just go to a constant. So say if you plot S as a function of L, you would find it just grows and then it just would saturate to some constant. And while for, for one-dimensional systems, there's actually a proof of this statement by Hastings but there's no general proof of this statement for uh, higher high dimensional systems. But so far all uh, numerical uh, kind of uh, experience shows that, uh, that it's actually true for gapped local Hamiltonians. At least I don't know any exception yet. So, and what I want to do now is that I want to use this fact, so I want to use this fact that we have states which have an area law, so that we have states that are close to product states, I want to introduce a concept how we can describe this small corner of the Hilbert space efficiently. And this brings us to the so-called uh, matrix product states. A small problem I'm facing is that there's a lot of rich stuff in each of those. I mean, there's a lot of things to say about entanglement and a lot about the area law in particular. But here I just want to briefly outline the concept. So I just wanted to introduce what we mean by entanglement entropy and that we have a big difference between product states where we would find zero entanglement. We have random states that have a lot of entanglement and I wanted to just to point out that ground states of local and gapped Hamiltonians are in a way very close to being product states and very far from being uh, random states. And now I want to make use of this uh, fact. So let me just now introduce matrix uh, product states. So let me now first start by giving you a uh, general um, many body body state and its most general form we just write the sum over all degrees of freedom like uh, i1 to il of some equation I1 to IL over I1 I2 IL. So this is the most general form of the state that we could write down, like defined again on our uh, system with L sides. Oh, yeah, I found. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. And this here is uh, what I would call like a rank L tensor. And here we see one big problem that we would have. Like, if we want to study some quantum, quantum anybody problem, so we want, for example, to diagonalize a Hamiltonian in this space, we actually have to deal with this object which has uh, 
where we need, in this case, uh, to store d to the L. So this is a huge object to work with, which makes uh, life extremely complicated, particularly if you want to uh, simulate systems exactly. So say that someone gives us a Hamiltonian and we are supposed to find the ground state, we would have to work in this huge Hilbert space. And this is something that uh, we can only do for, for very small systems. And the idea that I want to introduce now is this idea of matrix product states, which means that we take our uh, big object here from I1 to L, and we approximate it as a product of matrices. So this is one I one A two I two to A L I L. So the first the first one here is uh, is a vector actually. So this is uh, so so the first one is a vector. I think this is a vector and these ones would be matrices. Because like, if you just multiply all of them together, eventually we want to be left with a complex number. So, This is what I call now a matrix product state representation, where it just express the amplitudes of the wave function as a product of these matrices, where I just terminate this at the, the first one and the last one would be uh, just vectors. And now we can do the following. We can actually transform uh, this object here, like the amplitudes in a kind of generic many-body wave function, into this form by doing successive um, Schmidt decompositions of the state. And let us now like transform a kind of generic state. into an uh, MPS. Yes? Yes. Actually, for this sake, let me just maybe, each of them is, uh, let me see. Let me just write this out. So if we have, I1 to IL, it would be the sum of alpha 1, alpha 2, till alpha L over, now we have A1, I1, alpha 1, times A2, I2, alpha 1, alpha 2, a3, I3, alpha 2, alpha 3, da 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 da, to A, I, L, alpha L. Hmm? Oh, this is just a label, like, because each of them can be different or will be different in, in general. So I could also use A, B, C, D <laughs> as, di as different uh, objects. And this index I is the, what we call like the, the physical index. So for, for every uh, kind of local state, we can have a different matrix. So 
this index is for the site. So the, the matrix being on the first, or on the second, or third side, they can all be different. And the, they have on each side, they have an index for, for the physical. So in, uh, it, it's probably getting more clear for, for, for looking for some specific examples. Yeah, for, e for every side, we have D different matrices, yes. And let me just give some examples, because maybe then it's getting clear what I mean by this. So let us just assume a state which is, but let's just do, do the simplest state possible, maybe. We could just say that let us just have like our spin one half system, so we have up, down, up, down, uh, yeah, this up, down, up, down. This state here. So now this is a simple product state, and we can just write down the the matrices. So so here it actually turns out that the since the product state, the size of the dimension, the size of the matrix product state will just be one. So we just need one index here. And the matrices would be like this. We would say A, uh, <coughs> 1, up is equals to 1, and A, 1, down is equals to 0, and A, 2, up is equals to 0, and A, 2, down is equals to 1, and th then you see how it moves on. Because now, if I just um, write down my, my amplitudes in this wave function and have this sum, I will actually find out that all, like if I just perform this sum, I will find that, okay, if I have my psi uh, up, down, up, down, is equals to 1, and all others uh, will be 0. Right. So, so here we see that if I just choose those elements for those matrices, I will actually get the correct amplitudes for this particular state. Okay, let's use a slightly more complicated one. And this is a state psi, which will be 1 of square root of 2, up, 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 plus, down, 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 down. So this state is actually the state that uh, Paul Fenley talked about yesterday as being the, the ground state of this Ising model. Now, this state is clearly not a product state, so we cannot write it down with a very simple matrix product state representation where we have only a dimension one, but it's the next best one, so now we can actually find an expression where we have um, chi equals to two. And the, the state will look following way. We actually find that we have A one, well, one, will be just a one, one, oh sorry, a, a one up is equals to uh, two, yes? What? I, I think I need chi, as that chi, chi is the um, dimension of the matrices that I need to, to express. And here I will find the matrices in, in, in the middle. Uh, they will be the same. Let me just, I will be like up, will be 1, 0, 0, 1. And I, because they're always the same here, D will be equal to be 0, 0, 0, 1. 
and at the boundaries we just have the first column of this. Because now you see, if I just have, uh, if I just choose a given site in the up state, then the next one has to be also in the up state, and the next one has to be in the up state, the next one has to be in the up state, in order for the product of all of them to be uh, different from zero. And if one is in the down state, the next one has to be in the down state, the next one has to be in the down state, etc. cetera. Uh, and then we will actually get the amplitudes of this wave function. So you see that these are now two very simple examples where we have a matrix product state representation of, of wave functions. Does it make sense? Yeah? Yeah, I, we, we're coming to this in a second. I, I want to, because now I just looked at some simple cases, and maybe after the break I will just show how we can transform a generic quantum state into this form. And we're actually going to see that if we just would take, say, a, a random state and transform it into this matrix product state form, you would see that the dimension chi will actually grow exponentially with the system size. So basically, if if you just use this representation for a random state, this will just be a, a very expensive way of expressing the states and you will not gain anything. But for ground states of local Hamiltonians, and this will just bring us back to this area law, we will actually find that there is a very useful way to compress this information. Okay, yeah, wait, maybe this is a good point to have a break. Yeah? Say it again? Here? Oh. Oops, here. here? Alpha. Uh, here it's alpha, yeah. So it's probably right. I mean, that's good to see. So we have uh, one. Uh, yes, you're right. Thanks. Chi is the dimension of the matrices that you would need to express this state. That's right. I mean, for 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 these states here, I just um, know it by looking at it. Yes. But for it, as I uh, answered to this previous question, like if you have a generic quantum state, the bond dimension would actually increase. So uh, it turns out if you just m for the middle bond you will actually need a bond dimension that's exponentially large with system size. But this is what I want to show after this, um, after the short break. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> uh, what I pointed out before the break was that in this MPS representation, we are looking at a way to express the amplitudes in the many body wave function in terms of a product of these matrices, uh, or like a set of matrices that are defined on each side, etc. A, L, I, yeah. And I showed how we can do this for a very simple state, states in for, for, for which we could just basically look at the state and I could just write down the matrices. And then I found, okay, well, those matrices give us actually the right amplitudes uh, um, that, that we would like. But now I want to show a recipe or like some uh, concept that we can use to transform any given state where we, kn where, we, where we know the amplitudes into this matrix product state form. And this will be not a very useful algorithm because uh, generically we want to use these ideas to systems where we cannot write down the state exactly, but I think it just illustrates the, um, the main ideas uh, 
quite uh, nicely. So let us now say that we have a system of uh, um, our L sites, and we have a wave function defined on these L sites. And what I want to propose is the following. We already learned about the Schmidt decomposition, right? So the Schmidt decomposition was just a superimposed, like basically writing down is, um, or decomposing the state into a superposition of product states with respect to a given bipartition. And now I want to propose that we can do this successively on our state, and by this transforming the amplitudes in of our wave function into a matrix product state. So let's get started with this by just doing it with the first bond. So we simply do a Schmidt decomposition for the first bond. Uh, so and then we obtain from the Schmidt decomposition uh, states alpha, which I call now alpha one here, and I put like in the brackets here the index like uh, indicating which sites are described by those states. So here alpha one and these states are defined on the Hilbert space it includes only the first site. And we have states alpha one for the sites from two to L. Okay. And now we can just perform the Schmidt decomposition. So then I say psi is equal to lambda alpha one on say the first bond here times alpha one defined on site one times alpha one alpha one on sites two two site L. <laughs> Bless you. Good. And now I can define my first matrix of this matrix product state as actually being an expansion of the Schmidt state on uh, describing site one into a uh, local basis. So I say A alpha one on site one with index I one is equal to J one or I'm uh, sorry um, I I one I one is now the describing the the local Hilbert space on the first site of uh, alpha one on site one okay and now I move on to the next bond here. And I'm doing again a Schmidt decomposition of the states. Now I just get Schmidt states alpha two living on sites one and two and alpha two that defined on site three to site L. Okay, so now I do a the second Schmidt decomposition of my wave function psi. And then I express my matrices. So, so now I just uh, define my matrix two, I two, alpha one, alpha two, by just projecting by projecting the states alpha two on sites one and two onto the previous Schmidt state that we got from our first decomposition describing um, um, the left like alpha one uh, and I two. Oops, maybe like this. So now you see that each time I, I'm just going from the left to the right to my system, and I'm successively doing Schmidt decompositions, and I relate then the 
local bases and the previous Schmidt states to the new Schmidt state that I get from this uh, decomposition. And now I can do this going from left to the right through the system. And I can just exactly transform the state that I have into this representation. And then there's actually an equality here. The problem is that if I do the Schmidt decomposition, and this is pointed out in the first part, that if I do a Schmidt decomposition here, so say that I have my d-dimensional local Hilbert space, if I do a Schmidt decomposition here, how many terms do I need? D. And if I just do it on the second bond, d squared, and then d to the power 3, etc. So if I just do a funny plot, if I say that, well, I have my, uh, I don't know how many side systems, and I would plot the bond dimension that we need, or like the dimension, or the number of Schmidt states that we need to keep at each state, this is something that will grow exponentially as we go to the center bond. Right? So basically, in if we are at the bond in the center, the dimension will be d to the power of l half. And that's bad, because uh, what what I've basically done, I say like, well, I have my exponentially large object here with many, many complex numbers that I need to store. Now I'm transforming it into this complicated matrix product state form, and it's just uh, still requires exponentially many um, numbers. And uh, basically it does make things more complicated, not easy. But, and this is now the great thing which is related to this, this basically promise that we have that those states that we're interested in are very close to product states. Because if we have these states that fulfill an area law, it turns out then we do a Schmidt decomposition that only a few of the terms will actually contribute significantly and many of them uh, can actually be thrown away. And so basically the idea is now that says clearly if we just want to express the state exactly we have a bond dimension or like the number of states that we need to keep that is growing exponentially with the system size. But if we say that we just are allowed to just uh, neglect whatever is smaller than 10 to the minus um, 10, we would find that the bond dimension would just be like this. So we can actually just uh, represent it with a very small uh, number of states. And to illustrate this, I prepared some slides basically summarizing the main points again. So for these, say if we are interested in ground states of uh, local and gapped Hamiltonians, we find for one dimensional systems that there's area law that S of L, like basically for the length of a system, is constant. And by this, it just uh, kind of narrows us down, or like basically describes, or basically just narrows down the search for ground states or uh, to a very small corner in the Hilbert space. And in this, this small corner of the Hilbert space, it turns out we can express the states very efficiently. And this becomes maybe most clear by, by looking at this plot here. So what I did is I just um, uh, define a Hilbert space of this sort here. Uh, I forgot how many sites, maybe 10 sites. And then I do a bipartition of a system into two half chains by just cutting it in, in the middle. And then I'm doing a Schmidt decomposition, and here I'm plotting the Schmidt values. So here I'm plotting the Schmidt values, which I sorted according to their size. Right? So I have the largest ones first, and then I just, I was, uh, and then, then the size is decreasing. And uh, here I plot only the largest 20 out of uh, maybe several hundreds or thousands. And what we see, if we just pick a random state, basically the Schmidt states are roughly equal. Just note that the state that I'm looking at here is normalized, so the sum over all those uh, Schmidt values is, is 1. But now, if I, instead of choosing a random state, I choose a ground state of a local Hamiltonian. In this case, I just look at the ground state of a uh, 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 kind of transverse field Ising paramagnet we actually see that the Schmidt values decay very rapidly. So here we see that, uh, like this is like a uh, log scale, we see that if we take into account 
only the 20 largest Schmidt values, we already capture basically the entire weight of the wave function. Basically, if we just truncate the Schmidt decomposition here at 20, we actually uh, uh, make only an error of 10 to the minus 20 or so. So, and this is exactly what we can then use in this decomposition or like this rewriting of the state. We could say that, well, let's start from our very big wave function and we do successively our Schmidt decompositions. And then we will actually find that, well, at some point, the Schmidt values of con corresponding to the Schmidt states that we have are of the order 10 to the minus 20. Then we say that, well, let's forget about those and only take into account those that are uh, have a significant weight in, in, in the wave function. And by this, we can then compress the wave function. So it's, uh, we just have a wave function that uses many, many, um, uh, uh, basically, the number of parameters in the full wave function is d to the power of l, and then we can actually just boil it down to roughly l times uh, d times chi squared. Chi, d is the local Hilbert space dimension, and chi would be the um, uh, uh, kind of the average size of the matrices or the average uh, number of states that we um, that we keep. And by this we can so significantly reduce the number of parameters in the system. To illustrate this with a more fun example, we can do the following. In, instead of representing a quantum state, we can actually, yes? So the that depends very much on the state. If you have, if you have a random state, uh, if you have a random state as as this one here, then the um, if you just want to express it as a given accuracy, the um, or basically like if you want to change the norm density, whatever you want to look at as, as the measure. Um, then you need to have a bond dimension that increases exponentially with the system size. That's bad. So here, this would not would be a completely useless compression scheme. If, however, you have a, have a state that has, a, has, a, has an area law, then you will find that the um, size of the matrices that you need will actually be rather independent of, of the system size. Hmm? It is fixed, yeah. And let me just illustrate this with a more fun example. So, so what we said before is that we, we, we have a wave function, we express it in terms of our Schmidt decomposition. And the wave function, we can just rewrite always in terms of uh, some orthogonal basis describing the states on the left and some orthogonal basis describing the states on the right. And we have a particular kind of coefficient matrix Cij, and this is just the wave function. But instead of these Cij's representing the wave function, we could also say that this matrix here represents an image. Right? So we could say that a particular uh, number here indicates wher wh whether a pixel is dark or, or bright. So maybe 0.23 is a dark pixel and 0.56 is a brighter pixel. And what we can do is we can just uh, perform a singular value decomposition of this matrix. The singular value decomposition is, in is, is basically exactly the, um, um, the Schmidt decomposition. Right? So basically the unitaries that you get from the singular value decomposition are actually transforming this basis i into a basis uh, um, in which the uh, Cij matrix is uh, diagonal. Uh, so, and what we can do is we could say, well, let us just do a singular value decomposition of this matrix and then uh, restore the full matrix by keeping only into account the dominant singular values. Right? And this is exactly equivalent to this compression scheme that I proposed here, namely that we just uh, get rid of the small um, Schmidt values. And then we can just reconstruct the image and we actually see how well the compression is doing. So here we took a, an image 
that has uh, a dimension of roughly 1,200 pixel, uh, I think, on the smaller dimension. And now we just keep into account only four out of uh, the, f the four dominant um, singular values and reconstruct the image. And here we don't see much, but if we just take 16 out of more than 1,000, we already kind of see some of the main features. And then if we take 64, we just get almost uh, all the features that were in this uh, image. So here we actually see by our eyes that uh, this is a somewhat sensible way of kind of uh, representing states. Good. So this is the, uh, was just like a fun picture showing how we can compress things with the uh, singular value decomposition. And this is exactly what we are doing with the with matrix product states. Yes? Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is how you would call it for this uh, singular value decomposition. This is basically exactly the same story, yeah. That's right. Good. Okay, so, so what we did so far is we just looked at the uh, entanglement of these states. We found that the states that we're often interested in ha having this area law, and this area law, we could just uh, uh, argue, like for states that have an area law, we can argue that we have found an efficient way of compressing these states by doing these uh, successive Schmidt decompositions of the state and by then throwing away stuff that's uh, irrelevant. And good. And now there's a, uh, a few things that I want to note how we can actually, when we want to just do arithmetic with them or want to use these states. Because in the following, what we want to do is we want to actually use this representation of quantum states somewhat uh, in, for in, in, in different ways. The first, and this is what I want to do in the next lecture, I actually want to use this scheme here because I can actually show that using this representation of states, we can actually classify different um, quantum states of matter, in particular, how those um, matrices transform under symmetries will be very helpful. And in the last lecture, I will discuss it, say, say that we have this promise that the state can be represented in this form. How can we actually find it starting from some microscopic Hamiltonian, right? So, because here I just showed given that you have a state, how you can find this representation, but then I want to show, given a Hamiltonian, how we can find directly the state uh, in this representation. And it turns out, when we playing with these states, it will be very useful to use a diagrammatic representation of these tensors, uh, because otherwise things will turn out to be very messy. So, and this will be the tensor network representation. Mm. So, and all what I'm introducing now is just a notation how we can represent uh, all kinds of states which are consisting of tensors. And it's somewhat simple. So, if we have a scalar, this will be just a, a dot. So this will be, say, just a, a complex number A. If we have a vector, um, we will actually have just a dot with some leg sticking out. So this will be, say, something with one index AI. And th this index sticking out here will just basically indicate uh, this um, index I. If we have a matrix, it will be just something with two legs sticking out. Um, this will be just A, I, J, like one index to the left and one index to the right. Why is this useful? 
It will be very useful because at some point, in particular, when we want to talk about different algorithms acting or uh, using these kind of tensor product states, we actually will have to contract many of these tensors and uh, build rather uh, interesting constructions. But then when we have to place all kinds of sums over many indices, it will be very messy. So what we can do is now we can actually use this notation to uh, kind of show different tensor operations. So for example, if I multiplying some tensors, so, so say if I have C i k is equal to the sum of a i j b j k, where summing over j, then using this notation, it would simply read as uh, that we have here our C is equal to uh, a b. So we just if we if we just um, contracting over or summing over these indices, all we do is we just connecting those uh, legs to each other, and this indicates that we're just contracting over a given index. Okay. And if we use this notation now to express our um, matrix product states, like if we have matrix product states, then the wave function psi would just look like this, just uh, an object where we have L lag sticking out. So this is just uh, the, the rank L tensor that we are dealing with. And the matrix product state representation is simply this. So each of those guys in the middle are now our matrices uh, A, I, J, or A, I, alpha, beta. And then we have alpha, beta, I. Yes? What is it? Yeah, they still are. I mean, here we have now objects. So, so here we have things with three legs sticking out. These are like this alpha i, and now here at the side we have a i, but then we um, like this is i, and then we have only one index alpha. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's right. I mean, in in this notation. I, it's not visible what the dimension is, but the um, dimension is just taken care of. I mean, it, uh, the dimension is not visible from this representation. Yeah. Is okay. And and now having this notation, we can then just nicely uh, calculate. Uh, Quantity. So, for example, if I want to look at the overlap, the overlap of two two states or two different matrix product states, it would just be like this. So, this is a matrix product states maybe formed by matrices A, and then we have another matrix product state uh, where we say that these are B, and then we just take here the, the complex conjugate of them, and we just contract over those physical indices, and then this would be just the uh, overlap. You see, and now you see the how this makes life much simpler. If I would like to express this overlap in terms of a sum, uh, it would be many, many indices that I have to sum over and have to write. And, but here it's a very clean and simple notation to represent these states. I assume this makes sense to everyone?
Okay, now I want to introduce, so, so far when we have defined the matrices or the, the matrix product states, we can actually show that the definition of matrix product states is not uh, unique. In particular, I want to introduce a particular convenient form, which is a canonical form uh, of matrix product states. And from now on, I actually want to use, uh, just to make my life easier when writing, I want to use uh, infinite systems. Let us now, let us now consider, uh, basically, L goes to infinity, and assume that uh, we just have a translation invariant system where we can just uh, use the same matrix of A everywhere, right? So where we would just have A, 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 and this goes on forever. And then we find that the MPS uh, is not unique. Basically, if I have a given state um, Psi, then I can find many different ways of writing this in a matrix product state form. In particular, if I have now my matrices A, and if I go into a matrix product state where I just have x and x to the minus 1, so just take some invertible matrix and multiply it to the left and to the right, we see that the matrix product state will be the same because the, uh, but just using this representation here, then if I have uh, I have x here, x inverse, uh, x inverse, x, so all of those just cancel. So if I just multiply all these matrices together to, to form the amplitudes in the state, I will find that they are, will be the same. Uh, so, so there's a kind of gauge degree of freedom that we have in choosing the matrix product states. So we have a degree of freedom how we choose the matrix product states. And I want to choose a particular convenient form, namely, I want to choose these axes, or like I want to choose basically the, the, the bonds that I have here, such that they are directly related to the Schmidt decomposition. I mean, this is like how I initially motivated this matrix product state form. So I want that the bonds are directly related uh, to the Schmidt decomposition. And without loss of generality, I'm going to split my matrices into the following form. I say that I have my matrix A, alpha, beta, and I just write it as a matrix gamma, I, alpha, beta, times lambda, beta. So the lambda, beta, they are actually the Schmidt values for a decomposition at, at a given bond. And I want to choose this representation now in the following way that I have my, using this graphical notation now, I have my matrix product state, lambda, uh, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, and so on. And I'm choosing the representation of the matrix product state such that um, I automatically get my Schmidt decomposition when breaking apart some bonds. Right? So that this is equal to sum over alpha uh, let me see. One, two, three. Let me just remove one. So this is anyway to infinity. We just take all of them to the left where we have gamma, lambda, gamma, and then we just have here lambda, alpha, alpha, 
alpha, alpha, alpha, alpha, alpha, lambda. And this is now exactly the Schmidt. I mean, this is the state psi, and this is now the sum over alpha, alpha left, lambda, alpha, alpha, right. Okay, so let me just repeat. So we have, we are now considering a system that's infinitely large, and we're assuming translation invariance. So we have the same matrix everywhere in our matrix product state. Well, the matrices are not chosen uniquely. So if I just choose instead of A, X times A times X inverse, that will represent exactly the same quantum state. Well, now I can actually, I want to choose a convenient representation of the matrix product state, and I want to choose that the bonds here are directly related to a Schmidt decomposition of the state at a given bond. And for this, I just rewrite my matrices by splitting off the Schmidt values that I would get for a decomposition of the state at a given bond. And then I just write down the matrix product state of this form here. So they have some matrices gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda. So this is the matrix product state representation of my state on the infinite system. And chosen and, 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 and if I have chosen my bonds according to the Schmidt decomposition, I just get automatically my Schmidt states by saying that, well, I just multiplied all the matrices coming from infinity up to a given bond, and this gives me automatically the Schmidt states uh, alpha left, and if I just multiply everything from right infinity to this bond, I get my Schmidt states alpha right, and in the middle I have my, uh, um, my, my Schmidt values lambda. So, Yes? Yeah, so there is a, so you're asking, let's say that you have a matrix product state and you want to transform it to this yeah. form? Yeah. Because now to, to have this, we can write down particular conditions, namely what we, what we want is we want that the, um, the states that we get by multiplying everything from the left to this bond, uh, we want those to form orthogonal states. What this basically means is that we have alpha prime equal to the overlap, say if we just do that for the right, we have right uh, alpha prime, right? So this is what we want for this being in this particular form. We want to have this orthogonality. And now I can actually say that, well, if I just write this in, in um, using this form, this corresponds to the following. Um, so I just have here, I just can choose, because it's like at infinity, I can choose some boundary conditions here. And then I have gamma, lambda, gamma, Lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma star, lambda, gamma star, lambda, gamma star, lambda, gamma star, lambda, and so on. But now we see that what this actually amounts to is that we just keep multiplying these objects. So we have basically these objects which are actually transfer matrices. So for this being actually the, um, the delta function or the identity in this, this basis, so we have here alpha, alpha prime, what we actually want to have is we want that the uh, transfer matrix here has a dominant eigenvector, which is the identity, right? So basically from this, it follows that this condition is fulfilled, lambda, star lambda times basically delta alpha alpha prime is equals to delta alpha alpha prime. And the same we want to have for the left, gamma lambda 
Pi Gamma star Lambda Delta Alpha Alpha Prime is also Delta Alpha Alpha Prime. So the the condition that those lambda and alpha, uh, this gamma lambda pairs have to fulfill is that the right transfer matrix has a right eigenvalue, uh, uh, has a right dominant eigenvector that is the identity, and the left transfer matrix must have a left dominant eigenvector that is the uh, identity. So this is the condition that those tensors here in this form have to fulfill. In order to get this, I mean to answer your question, what we can do is we could say that you, you have some matrix given, so, so you have your matrix, some, some matrix given for a, for a matrix product state, and now you find just the dominant, the, the right and the left dominant eigenvector, which will most likely not be the identity, and then you actually transform, you can then, from this equation, you can then find that what kind of transformation you have to do here and here in order to bring it to this canonical form, namely to bring it into a form where you have a right dominant eigenvector that is the identity and to have a left eigenvector that is the identity. Good. So, and with this kind of transformation, we can then get the matrix product state into this uh, canonical form. And this canonical form is uh, particularly convenient because say that we want to calculate some expectation values um, of a system. So now we have a system that's in particular infinitely large. And if we want to calculate some local expectation value, where we have psi and some operator only acting locally, or basically is doing acting non-trivially only locally on a part of the wave function, then using this notation, we in principle have to contract infinitely many from the left and from the right, and then we have some operator acting, say, on, on a given site. So in particular, we would have to find the fixed point coming from the right and from the left to evaluate this expression. But if it's in this canonical form, we already know what the um, kind of dominant eigenvector of the transfer matrix from the left and from the right are, they're just simply identities. So this will actually just simply be this. We just take one gamma here and one gamma star lambda squared. So if we have this uh, convenient form, namely this canonical form of matrix product states, then um, we can evaluate local expectation values very easily. I was thinking to discuss now symmetries of matrix product states, but given that I haven't had any questions for a while, I maybe should discuss some questions because I assume there might be some. Or even worse, there are not any. <laughs> so. So you're asking if you have uh, if you have a form for this, like a, a, a matrix product state that's in this canonical form. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in the simplest case, the um, the product state that I discussed in the beginning is in this canonical form, because then you have only a single state. That's uh, maybe a too trivial example, but I could give. Oh, maybe this is a good way. Yeah. Let me just discuss the last few minutes a concrete example of a. Of a, of a matrix product state for, for a non-trivial system, and the homework could be that you, ha that you show it's in the canonical form. Uh, let's do this one here. So, and there's in particular an, a nice model, which we're also going to discuss later on a little bit, and this is the uh, AKLT model. So this is the Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Tasaki model, which actually uh, predated matrix product states, but actually it turned out that they wrote down a Hamiltonian where the state is exactly a matrix product state. And 
the AKLT model is, is a one-dimensional model, which is a spin one model. So on each side, we have uh, a basis, which is minus one, zero, and one. And the Hamiltonian that I want to look at is just the sum over projectors of uh, j, j plus one onto an s equals to two state, which in the spin basis we can just write as s, j, s, j plus one plus one third times s, j, s, j plus one plus two third. Good. Now, now we just um, choose the following. Which one? This one? This is two thirds. This is one third times SJ, SJ plus one. And this is two thirds. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is square. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, now we can actually express this ground state exactly is a matrix product state. So the ground state the ground state uh, is, a, is, a, is an exact uh, MPS. And the matrices uh, are then given by uh, A plus is square root of three half times um, sigma plus. So this is a poly matrix plus and a naught is equal to minus one third times sigma z and a minus is given by minus square root of three times sigma minus. And I <laughs> maybe you can prove me wrong, but I think when I wrote it in this form, I, m I brought it into this canonical form. So you could just use this matrix product state and calculate or uh, obtain the transfer matrix, which will be a four by four matrix, and find if the dominant eigenvector is actually proportional to the identity. So that would be an exercise, because if you, yeah, like the exercise would be um, show that the MPS uh, is canonical, is, in a spin is canonical. Or is in, is in canonical form. I don't know, I also sent some notes at some point, uh, if someone, uh, uh, were these notes accessible? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Good. Are there more questions? I mean, morally, what you have to do is you just um, write down the transfer matrix of the, you just write down the transfer matrix for the state that you just have given in, in potentially the non-canonical form. Then you find the dominant eigenvector of this one. So you would find that, well, find the largest eigenvalue of this one, like maybe of x is equals to I'm using x too often, but um, <laughs> but this is just like whatever the dominant eigenvector is with some do dominant eigenvalue. And now you actually transform the matrices A such that you actually 
that, that the dominant eigenvector would be the identity. So basically, what, like one way of doing this, a different way of doing it, but you could just basically do a, a eigenvalue decomposition of, of, of this object x and multiply uh, the one part here and the other part here. And, and then you just brought it onto the right canonical form. Then you just play the same for the left canonical form and just transform this on the left. Yeah. What, what? This one should be this one should be one, yes. Yeah, so it it should like the requirement is that the right and the left eigen uh, the, the, the right eigenvalue of the right transfer matrix has a dominant eigen it has a dominant eigenvalue one and the corresponding eigenvector is the identity. And for the left dominant eigenvector it's also an eigenvalue, the last eigenvalue is one and the corresponding eigenvector is identity. Yeah, for observables, if you if you have your matrix product state, so they, this would be like for the infinite for, for an infinite system. Now, if you want to calculate an, uh, a local, like an, a lo by by local observable, I mean, as 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 Paul said, that we have like some observable that acts only trivially on most sides, but it just acts non-trivially maybe on on one side here. Then we just apply it here. Uh, that could be, for example, just the sigma z operator acting on, on this side. And then, I mean, you have like this one would be psi, and then you have to just multiply with the conjugate of this one, which would be this. But now you see that, well, this is going from like to right infinity, and this is going to left infinity. But we have this identity here. Basically, if you take gamma lambda gamma uh, lambda star and you just multiply it with an identity you just get the identity back so you just can remove this part and then you have this one and so on so you can remove all these parts by using this identity and eventually you are left with something that you can very easily evaluate so, so that's a very nice property and in fact there are several algorithms that always work in this canonical form. So then you actually find the ground state. So you can then, using these matrix product state techniques, you can just directly simulate a system in the, in the, term in, in the thermodynamic limit. And then you can just measure all kinds of local observables like uh, maybe the energy for a bond or the magnetization. You can just uh, uh, measure very, very easily. Okay, if there are no more questions, then um, thank you.